Uh, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about my favorite subject. We'll go through a bit of questions that deal with my favorite subject, and it goes like this. But before I start, I want to thank the team of, uh, of researchers, this big family tree of researchers uh, with whom uh, you know, I can't do the work that we do without their help. So stop me when this looks familiar. You're working with a client, a child or adolescent, and you want to get a sense of their mental health status. You'll ask the client a series of questions, how they're thinking, feeling, behaving. And you also ask some of the same kinds of questions to significant others in their lives, parents and teachers. Even when you administer the same questions, the same item responses, hold everything constant, you often get a different answer depending on who you ask. The answers to those questions push us clinically and, and in terms of research in all kinds of different directions. Depending on who you ask, you come to different answers as to who requires care. What care should I deliver? Is care, is the, are the services I'm delivering working? And at the end of the day, are the interventions we're, we're, uh, we're delivering making a lasting impact on the people we care for? So for me, the answer to the question of why do people give you different answers about child and adolescent mental health is a big deal. What we've been finding is that oftentimes the answer to that question is seemingly straightforward. Children and adolescents lead complex lives. What do I mean by that? I'm going to start off with an example that's endemic to the work that our lab's doing, but then I'm going to branch out and talk about a series of examples across a whole host of different clinical conditions and a whole host of developmental periods. Let's say I have an adolescent who comes to my clinic and they experience profound symptoms and impairment during structured performance-based settings where the, where the rules of engagement, the rules of social performance are pretty clear. Right? But that same adolescent might kind of work OK. Their symptoms and impairment don't really manifest all that much when they're interacting one-on-one -on -one with an adult authority figure or somebody they know pretty well. I have another client who, oddly enough, does pretty well functionally when there's a big audience. But when you shrink that audience down to one person, that's where the symptoms and impairments show. They say Prince was like this. Big audience, but when you shrink it on one-on-one, -on -one, people who knew him one-on-one -on -one, uh, kind of figured he had, he, had, he had some concerns. Still another. Uh, uh, a client, maybe an adolescent, does well here, does well here, but when the rules of social engagement go out the window, you're not quite sure how to engage with other people, that's where their symptoms and impairments show. All three of those clients more, might work quite well, might function quite well when they're with their friends, people they know really well. If I were to take a person, ask the adolescent, to observe their own behavior for a series of weeks, and then be ask people in their lives, to observe their behavior for a series of weeks. Should I really expect the same answer, depending on what I ask? I'll pitch the question more broadly. Show of hands here. Who here thinks that adolescents behave the exact same way, regardless of whether or not they interact with their teachers, their parents, and their friends? That's a weird question, right? Weird question. Silly. Andy, why are you asking that? Well, I'm asking that for a couple of things, because there's a thing as a, as a clinical psychologist I struggle with a lot, and it goes like this. We all can generally agree that the clients in the samples we recruit in research and the clients we see, in, we see in our clinics behave very differently from each other. I just showed you three examples of adolescents who experience social anxiety concerns in very different ways. You can come up with any kind of clinical condition that you uh, 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 care for in your own clinic and probably think about, think the same way. Find three kids who, who behave very different from each other. But our brains are hardwired to make decisions. And we like patterns in decisions. And we like patterns that are really easy to understand. So oftentimes, if you think about the information sources you're gathering, you want them to look like this. Yes, 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 yes. Help that, help that, help that. The, the teacher, the parent, the adolescent are all giving the exact same thing. That rarely happens. But it's hard to really struggle, really struggle with that conflict between the diversity that we, that we see coming into the clinic and the answers we really hope we get to deal with. Because then this makes life easy. Now, I just gave an example of adolescent social anxiety. This is something that we care about a whole lot because the evidence supports the idea that 
More often than not, you get different answers depending on what you ask when it comes to assessing social anxiety. But it turns out that you do see the same kind of thing regardless of what you see, regardless of who you administer assessments to, regardless of who you're making clinical decisions about. Here's some data. It goes to this, this question of how often do we see these things? Do you see, do you see these, these discrepancies among reports of mental health functioning? So, now about 30 years ago, uh, Tom Achenbach uh, published a very influential meta-analysis uh, where, where he looked at all the studies from the 50s till about the mid 80s that, looked, that, that provided data on, uh, from multiple informants and, and computed a correlation between one informant's report about a child and another informant's report about another child. And like most things in the world, they found an average correlation of about 0.28, which the statistician, Jacob Cohen, would say is a, approaching a moderate magnitude correlation. So remember from stats, low correlation 0.1, moderate correlation 0.3, large correlation about 0.5 and above. So we did that same meta-analysis, taking all the studies that, that have been published since the Achenbach meta-analysis. Roughly 300 studies, lots of, lots of, uh, of different uh, samples. <coughs> Same thing. Across time. Who here has heard the term open science? Open science. The replication crisis. Heard of this, all right? So you know where that's coming from? A bunch of fancy pants journals in our field were driven, this is painting a very broad brush here, were driven to gather studies, cute studies, sexy findings that really people could make no sense about, but it sounded really cool and it could get some headlines, right? All right. So, so um, you know, I didn't pick this in advance, but, you know, years later, seeing this open science thing, I'm really happy that I studied the most unsexy thing you can possibly study when you talk about child and adolescent uh, mental health research. Because across time, the effect is basically the same thing. All right. We did a follow-up to that, uh, that meta-analysis, and uh, the paper's now under review. We're really excited about this, because we went back to those 300 some odd studies, and we looked to see where the data was coming from. I mean, for a lot of research, most of it's conducted here, or in Europe, in Canada, and, 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 uh, and bits and, bits and uh, places all over the world. So we were curious as to whether or not this was an effect we were seeing uh, you know, in large part because all the studies are conducted in one place. They're not. 30 countries, several hundred samples, 1,500 data points, and think back to stats, 95% confidence interval, 95% of the Pearson correlations across those 1,560 data points range from approaching moderate to moderate. <coughs> It's the same thing we're seeing in every country. OK. OK, so we all see it. What does it mean? There have been a few hints over the years about what they mean. And from time to time, we get pushed in different directions. Well, well uh, you know, maybe, it's, maybe it's just error. Maybe it's just that some of these measures we're administering aren't all that reliable. And when you compute two correlation, a correlation between two measures that aren't all that reliable, of course, you're going to get a low correlation. Maybe it's radar bias. Maybe, maybe some of these uh, informants are really stressed out when they complete the measure. Right? And that makes it harder for them to really attend to and understand neutral and positive behaviors that adolescents, or children and adolescents are experiencing and attend more to the negative things. We studied that for a long time. By the way, neither one of those two things explains this. Achenbach, years and years ago, was basically telling, tell, you go back to read that 87 paper. Every time I read it, I, I pick up on a new thing. But way back then, uh, Achenbach was saying, it is, this is an unreliability, the, uh, unreliability thing. This isn't a bias thing. This is a context specificity thing. When you see a low correlation between two people, it's because A, the kids behaving differently depending on where they are, and B, these people observe this, the, the, uh, these kids in different places. Several layers of evidence indicate this. I'm going to go through the first pieces because I think they're quite informative. So one of the key moderating factors that Achenbach found in his meta-analysis was that people tend to agree more when stuff is easier to see. Aggressive behavior, hyperactivity, relative to things that are a little harder to see. There are some observable elements to things like anxiety and depression, but not all of them. Some of them are, are, are pretty internal. They're hard to see. 
We saw that too, although the effect isn't all that big. This isn't, this isn't nearly as big as it was in, in, uh, uh, when Achenbach conducted his in 87. Another thing, people tend to agree more when they see stuff in the same place. Pairs of parents, pairs of teachers, pairs of clinicians. We saw that too. For both internalizing problems and externalizing problems. We were curious, uh, you know, based on some recent research that was comparing the reliability and validity of continuous measures versus discrete measures of psychopathology. Uh, Christian Markon, who's a um, professor over at Iowa, I believe, conducted a really good meta-analysis, I think in 2013, uh, looking at, at, a, at, a, at whether or not you get more bang for your buck if you measure things continuously versus discreetly. Short answer is yes. You get more bang for your buck with, the, with the continuous measures versus discrete measures. And it's not even close. Um, so we thought to ourselves, well, if that's the case, then it should be the case that you probably get a little higher agreement when you measure things continuously than discreetly. And you do, but you get way, way bigger uh, differences than I expected. Um, if, if low correspondence among reports, informant discrepancies upset you, don't use the structured interview because you're going to get way more than you expected. Uh, use something else. Um, now, now uh, I will say, of course, that, that, that I think this these data speak to this issue of not every measure is perfectly reliable or perfectly valid. Um, I'm going to talk, I'm going to make an argument that these discrepancies, uh, reports, can become useful tools so long as you set up your assessments correctly to, to, uh, to properly interpret the discrepancies. Um, but they're not going to give you uh, complete, accurate, reliable information. There's going to be a piece of it that will still be measurement error. And I think these data kind of speak to that. You find it for externalizing and internalizing. Okay. So in observing Achenbach's findings, in observing some of, the, some of the data we are coming out of our group, we started thinking to ourselves, there must be some way of conceptualizing this problem to start making predictions. Because part of the reason why these discrepancies are so difficult to, to get a handle on is that when you get them, there usually isn't little other pieces of data you can use to corroborate whether or not you think these discrepancies are useful. So one of our first instincts when we collect data from social, uh, about social anxiety from adolescents is, well, if the parent says one thing and it's higher, and the adolescent says another thing and it's lower, well, adolescents, a core feature of social anxiety is fear of negative evaluation. They're probably downplaying their concerns because they don't want to look bad in front of a clinician. Right? In the absence of any other data, it seems like a reasonable hypothesis. And it's easy to sort of gravitate to, to, to those discrepancies when there's nothing else to really grasp on and to test whether or not that's an accurate reflection of what you think is going on. So we started thinking to ourselves, if these discrepancies are useful, uh, you know, well, it might be the case that some, uh, some uh, uh, children and adolescents do behave consistently across, across context. What, is that, what, are, what, are the, what does that information mean? And when people do differ, maybe there's sometimes when, they, when the information is useful and sometimes when it's not. So we created a framework published recently that, that, that gets at this sort of question, how do you start making heads or tails of this to then inform decision making about collecting data and making, and making informed decisions about these reports. So we envision some circumstances when we do get cases where a child or adolescent client is displaying concerns, symptoms and impairment across contexts. We've seen them. And oftentimes, we can get those, the, those instances where different people in their lives are actually corroborating each other's reports. That happens sometimes. I'll show you some data to indicate that it does. And sometimes, you find the opposite of that, where a child or adolescent or client is behaving differently at home or at school, at school or, at peer, or within peer interactions. And that, that should logically lead to different people seeing different things. And then sometimes, we just didn't prep well for the assessment. We administered different kinds of measures to different people. Maybe we find afterwards that, that, that a measure wasn't nearly as reliable or valid in, a, in, a, in assessing a, uh, a child analysis concerns as we might have expected. And the discrepancies aren't all that useful. Knowing, distinguishing this kind of discrepancy 
from this kind of discrepancy is really helpful. Because if what you have is this, then things become more straightforward. Then you can average scores. Then you can start making, using those decision rules that, that we often use. I'll say that there's a concern here that requires care if anybody tells me that it requires care. If the discrepancies aren't useful, then, it's, then you're justified in doing that. But it's quite one thing um, to think that and quite another thing for the data to start screaming that at you. So, so, so making this distinction is really important. OK. So given all that, can we find some controlled evidence to indicate that under some circumstances, these discrepancies contain useful information? The answer is yes. I'll, I'll lay out one example. And what I'd like you to do, what I encourage you to do, before we get into the example, is start thinking of uh, uh, the concern you assess most or you care for most in your clinic. I'm going to show you a description about destructive behavior in young kids. And if that's one of the concerns that you see in, in, in your office in your caseload, use that one. But, if you, but whichever one you see the most, try to think about a handful of kids where you'd make different predictions about what the information sources that you collect data from would tell you. Because right. I'm going to show you very different kinds of kids. So, disruptive behavior in young children, in preschool children, uh, has traditionally followed you know, this kind of process where you kind of assume that teachers are giving you school stuff, parents are giving you home stuff, and young children might behave very differently depending on where they are. And that's an assumption we often make clinically, but going back about 10 years, I thought, you know, we thought to ourselves, is there any good data to support that? There's some correlational data from, from the meta-analyses, but is there anything, any controlled evidence to indicate that, that that actually might be characterizing these issues? Thankfully, I was doing internship at the University of Illinois Chicago, where Lori Walkslug was. And my first day on internship, Lori asked me, what are you interested in? And I told her, and she had this big Cheshire cat grin on her face. She was like, you're going to like it here. <laughs> she has this gigantic data set. Of, uh, of, uh, of young children who came in uh, you know, for uh, her Chicago preschool project. She recruited roughly 300 kids. Uh, and she had a really great recruitment strategy where she recruited some kids um, based on clinic-referred concerns. And then she went to primary care clinics and then administered a screening measure to identify those kids who weren't coming in for clinical services but might need them, uh, and also some kids who weren't coming for clinical services, at least for disruptive behavior, um, and didn't show any evidence as of yet that they showed concerns. Really nice diverse sample. Here's what Lori did. Years ago, before she, before she and I thought we'd work together on something like this, um, she collected a bunch of data from the mothers about what was going on with disruptive behavior in the, in the children. She got the same kind of information from teachers. And she did so apart or independent of this behavioral measure that she administered in the, in the clinic too. Who here, has heard of, who here has used the Autism Diagnostic Observation Schedule, the ADOS? Yeah. So uh, Lori, I'll go into this in a second, but Lori developed this version of, of the, uh, that observation called, schedule called the Disruptive Behavior Observation Schedule, the DBDOS. Disruptive Behavior Diagnostic Observation Schedule, the DBDOS. What we did was two things. We first set an a priori threshold for, for figuring out uh, among parents and teachers on their reports, were there circumstances where, te where parents said there was, there was an identified disruptive behavior that, that the teacher didn't corroborate? All right, they said no, but parents said yes. Was there circumstances where it was the opposite, where teachers identified disruptive behavior that the parents didn't corroborate? Teachers said yes, parents said no. And then, of course, were there, were there two groups in between, where neither of them said yes, and, uh, were, uh, and also both of them said yes. For those same families, Lori Walkschlag administered a, 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 this diagnostic paradigm that's pretty interesting. So uh, this came from clinical observation on Lori's part. Years ago, she would administer these, these standard sort of behavioral observation assessments in the clinic. 
And parents, after those behavioral assessments, would come to her and say, you didn't get anything from this. My kid behaved like an angel now. Like, like they, they don't behave like this at home. And Lori said, you know what? I gotta, if this is what I'm getting clinically, I gotta develop a way to press for this stuff, to press for the elicitation of disruptive behavior, right? And what she does is, like a measure, like a multi-item scale, she picks out a series of things that she has different adult authority figures in the, in the child's life do with them. They'll do like a, like a clean up, a play task, where they'll do free play for about five minutes. And then the adult authority figure in the room, it's either the parent or a non-parental adult, like a clinical examiner, which for us is kind of a proxy for a teacher for how a child behaves in non-home settings. And, and then afterwards, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the adult asks, hey, can you help me pick these up? And the child, you know, is three, four, five years old. They're going to get no sometimes. They're going to get yes sometimes. They're going to vary. Now, do you, do you say, hey, this kid says no here, game over, disruptive behavior? Nah. What Lori does is administer a series of other tasks and starts looking to see, do I see a pattern here? Do I see a child who consistently displays disruptive behavior above normative expectations? Really powerful tool. Really powerful tool to, to, to think about and, and conceptualize disruptive behavior in young children, but also really helpful in this, in this context. Because if the, if the two authority figures, the parent and the unparental adult, are doing the same thing with this child, and the child behaves differently, I might have a circumstance where I can start picturing somebody, at least in a controlled setting, that behaves one way at home and another way outside of the home. And if I can do that, then I can figure out, do I get a match? Do I get a match between these, these, uh, the, the kinds of kids who behave disruptively with their parent, but not the non-parental adult? And does that same kid also tend to be the kind of kid who shows disruptive behavior in their parent's survey, but not the teacher? It's a great investigative tool. So here's what we found. First things first, do we get variability in the sample? Do we get different kinds of kids who behave in very different ways during these tasks? The answer is yes. You actually do find a, a clump of kids, roughly about 8% of the sample, that consistently display disruptive behavior at a high probability of disruptive behavior across these contexts the kind of kid that might behave disruptively at home and at school. Then you had this, this kid that was kind of more examiner specific. They're the kind of kid that appeared to show more disruptive behavior in non-home settings than in home settings. Then we found the reverse, the reverse kind of kid who tended to show disruptive behavior in the, in the home setting to a greater extent than the non-home setting. And then, because the sample was, dist was uh, distributed as such, where you would find some kids, plenty of kids actually, who don't show any evidence for their type of behavior, at least consistently, that's that orange group. All right? Now, we used this, uh, this fancy pants kind of um, analytic tool called uh, latent class analysis, which is like a way of doing factor analysis, but instead of using items, instead of looking like items in a measure, like subscales, we looked at people subgroups of people, right? So when you do these, these, uh, these models, sometimes, if you're lucky, if you're lucky, uh, you get this group that pops out that becomes your control group. That's that orange group. Our orange group is a control group. So we look to see, is there any way, is there a way for us to differentiate those top three groups from that orange group? Depending on who says this child displays disruptive behavior. When the parents said yes, we found clear differentiation among the, 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 the both group, the both home and non-home compared to orange. We also found differentiation between the parent-only group, but we didn't find differentiation among the examiner group. Step one, looks like parent yes, teacher no, might give us some useful clinical information. We also appear to be getting some good clinical information, at least in this sample, from the kids for, uh, uh, that, that tended to display disruptive behavior from the, uh, in the examiner with the examiner, but not the parent. Because when the teacher said yes and the parent said no, that group got differentiated from the control group. 
And then the, the results kind of flip, where you get non-significant effects in the group that was previously significant. What about when they both say yes? When they both say yes, both of those other two groups fall off the table. Non-significant. And, and, the, the, and these, this gigantic odds ratio, you're lucky if you get like a 1.5. This is, this is, this, that's a lot. Um, <laughs> I never see that again. Um, uh, it, it, you get this really big uh, differentiation between the both group and the control group. So what does this tell us? At least with disruptive behavior, it taught us that when parents and teachers tell us different things, it might be mapping on to changes, contextual changes in behavior across home and non-home contexts. And when they correspond, doesn't happen often, but it happens sometimes, you also get some good data to indicate that maybe you're seeing consistent displays of, of concerns across contexts. Interestingly enough, the uh, reviewers, when, when, they, when we first submitted the paper, they said, hey, you know, all this is fine and good. Is it explained by impairment? No. These, the three groups, those three top three groups, are not significantly different on impairment. Um, there's a really good paper from 2009. Uh, Ferguson's group over, in, over uh, overseas did a longitudinal study looking at, at context-specific displays of conic problems. So adolescents for whom the parent said conic problems, teacher said no, opposite, teacher said yes, parent said no, and then both. And look at the longitudinally. Those three groups don't differ on adult onset outcomes later on. Think about cognitive problems. 15 symptoms, at least in the DSM, 15 symptoms. Some of the symptoms, if I were to ask you, raise a hand, uh, show of hands here, who, who of you skipped class in high school? 90% of you would raise your hands and the rest of you would be lying. <laughs> uh, and then you got the other ones. Sexual assault, physical cruelty to an animal. Lying, conning, uh, lighting fires, breaking into a house, building your car. A lot of this stuff is very difficult to see. You're lucky if one of them says yes. All right? Really covert stuff. Of course the, the, those three groups wouldn't differ from each other. Because the, because the set of presentations are so variable that you can get into the conic sort of club if you pick a fight every once in a while. You know, tell your mom you're not coming home. And then, uh, and then just don't come home. But then you have the other ones who, who, are, who beat up on rabbits and light fires. And, and, the, 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 and those two people are still treated the same way diagnostically. I Maybe mean, not clinically, but diagnostically. So of course you're going to see, you, you might not see differences in impairment. You do see, you do, of course, see some of these effects like conversions relating to impairment in other conditions. So several years later, uh, uh, a buddy of mine, Matt Lerner, and I, who actually has been here to speak, yeah, I love Matt. Matt's one of the smartest people I know. So Matt thought, okay, you saw that with disruptive behavior. Can we see the same kind of patterns with uh, pervasive developmental disorders? Right. Turns out you can. You can, cl you can identify subgroups of parents and teachers who rate in very different ways. Uh, with parents saying something's there, the teacher doesn't. This is for neurodevelopmental conditions. Think about that. Now here, when parents and teachers converge on the presence of these concerns, that does point to significant increase, significant uh, uh, significantly different levels of impairment. Here's one place where convergence actually gives you good information on impairment um, uh, in, in a pretty large sample. Other places where you might find um, convergence yielding some indication of severity, some places where, where, where it's useful. So sometimes when you're assessing an adolescent for their concerns, you might rely on their parents, on a couple of their parents, who, who presumably are observing behavior in, under similar context, maybe an identical context, but similar context. And you might ask yourself, is there a way uh, for me to sort of average their, their, uh, their, their, uh, their scores so I can get in a sense of, of overall level of severity, at least in the home? Um, we've done, in recent work, have, uh, have tested whether or not that's the case, where at least in community-based samples, can you start you know, using the average or, or, uh, you know, or, or a composite of, peop of people's scores when they observe behavior in the same place. At least with mothers and fathers in a large sample of, uh, of adolescents, that's, uh, that's some, of the, uh, some of our recent data is pointing, at, pointing, to that, pointing to that, that you can do that. And, um, for those of you who also see adults, to think to yourself, well, I can get away with this with the adults. They, 
I don't, I don't see any of that stuff, this, this low correspondence discrepancy stuff with adults. Yes, you do. Uh, uh, in, in social anxiety disorder assessments for, for, uh, for adults, and a whole lot of other things too, um, there's, a, there's a really good meta-analysis from Achenbach's group again in, in uh, 2005 that, uh, that, that, uh, that characterizes the, uh, the state of affairs for correspondence levels of multi-informant assessments of adults. They find the same correlate, low correlations too. But here, at least with social anxiety disorder, what we find is that A, you can identify anxiety disordered patients who, exp who display consistent social, social uh, skills deficits across social interaction contexts, different kinds of one-on-one -on -one interactions, uh, you know, public speaking tasks, things like that, and then find some that show, that show their deficits more sporadically. And for that top group, that across context group, the clinician and the, uh, and the, and the, uh, the, the client show higher levels of convergence in reports. Between uh, relative to the to the one where the where the uh, the, uh, the 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 clients displaying concerns sporadically across these independent assessments, in each of these cases, the independent assessments were key. Being able to, to gather data to have access to data, where the informants you were relying on were not involved, allowed us to make to make draw inferences or interpretations as to as to what those discrepancies or lack thereof might reflect. Each of those, those places, in the absence of those data, we'd be, at, we'd be at square one. We would not know what's going on. Really important. You know, because they allow us, these independent assessments allow us to be able to test whether or not a particular way of thinking about these discrepancies holds water. Is there data to back it up? Because now we're going to get to this point where we start asking ourselves, well, what do you do? What do you do with, with, these, uh, with these, uh, these reports to make them useful? And it turns out that, in my opinion, a lot of the stuff that we're doing with these multi informants you might do differently, you're already kind of doing in other places. You're just basically applying some of the same kinds of principles you'd use over here for this too. It goes like this. So for one thing, you can predict these discrepancies. Remember that, that graph before? Crossing homework correlation 0.28 in 87 and 2015, all right? Embedded in those, in those, uh, those meta-analyses are nearly 500 studies, published studies across a host of clinical conditions that you can use as intelligence. So you can start making uh, inferences based on those studies about the pattern and direction that you'd expect in, the, in advance of collecting data from an individual, individual family. You can use those data, and they probably won't be that, that far off. And then, this is something you're already doing. Do it here too. Understand your client's spaces. Now you think about those things in terms of forming clinical techniques. How are my exposures gonna look? How are, my, how are the interactions I'm gonna use in, in, in the clinic gonna work? Use it there. Use it here too, to, in advance of collecting the data. Start getting a sense of whether or not, is there scaffolding that the parent is doing at home that they just don't, they, they just don't see at school? And maybe that's one of the reasons why I might expect the teacher to say something the parent doesn't, or the opposite. Maybe there's a lot of like really dysfunctional parenting, a, a, a dysfunctional family functioning stuff that's going on in the home. And, and when they get to school, there's enough going on there. Um, the school's using the good behavior game. You know, the, the, the school's using something there. Something's happening over there that, that, that might make it where I see something rated by the parent that I don't see with the teacher. And might these differences in their social context translate into similarities or differences in, 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 the, in the reports? I mean, you might find some circumstances where the, where the spaces are giving you consistent data that there's a risk factor in there or a lack of protective factors in each of these places where, where the development and maintenance of concerns in both places makes a whole lot of sense. And then once you gather this information, start making hypotheses. What do I expect to get from the teacher's report? What do I expect to get from the parent's report? What do I expect to get from the, other, from the information sources I'm gathering? And then start thinking about ways you can gather independent assessments. What pieces of data, school records, uh, you know, uh, health records, you know, uh, an interaction that I can, uh, that I can administer in, 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 the, uh, in the lab or in, 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 the, in the clinic. What can I do other than 
what I'm getting from the informants that will allow me to draw heads or tails, make heads or tails of, of the patterns of scores I get, I get back. Pretend the informants are, I don't know, a dossier. Yeah? Uh, 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 and, uh, and, and you're getting information there from this dossier, and you don't, expect, you don't accept it as true. It's, it's, it's just pieces of data that, that, uh, that you can use to then start figuring out, can I corroborate this stuff? All right? So I, I, I go back, nowadays I go back to this, this, uh, this line that, uh, that, 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 uh, that Reagan had, you know, trust but verify. This was in, con in the context of, uh, of interacting, I think, with uh, the Soviet Union at the time, wasn't it? Um, uh, trust but verify. I get it. Look, the data we get, the reports we get, are based on measures that some of us, you know, have used for 20 or 30 years. I mean, do we really think that the low correspondence we get from uh, the teacher's report form, this child behavior checklist, or the youth self-report can be chucked at the measurement error? That fact, that structure, the second, but those subscales, you see them in the States, in Canada, in Jamaica, in, in the Philippines, in Thailand, you see it everywhere. Um, you know, is, is, is it really logical to think that when, the, when two people see things differently on those same forms, that one of them is biased or has a bad day or, no, they, they, in all likelihood, they, they might be pointing you in different directions for real reasons. This is the question that we've been thinking about um, over the last five years where I feel less good about talking about it, but I'm going to talk about it anyway because we're really excited about it. And it, goes, and it goes like this. Maybe you don't have circumstances where you can get multiple informants. Maybe you have circumstances where you do get multiple informants, but for some reason there's a piece of the client's space that you're not capturing all that well, but you don't really know how to get it. So we're going to go back to social anxiety because it turns out that among adolescents, we see a lot of social anxiety where? When they're interacting with their friends. When, oh, even not, when they're interacting with their not friends. Yeah? Show of hands here, who collects reports from peers? Unfamiliar peers in their clinic. Because we do. Let me show you what we're talking about. This is great. Um, so, so, okay, so here's what happens. Here's what happens, and this is the reason why we, we did it. So I'm gonna walk you, I'm gonna tell you a very brief story that led us to, to doing something pretty crazy. I'll show you in the next slide. So when adolescents come for social anxiety, remember, they come in for an assessment, maybe an adolescent gives us this, parent gives us this, and they're like, what's going on here? Because I think that if I see this pattern, I'm, I'm just getting nothing from the adolescent. There's nothing going on here. Or I see the reverse direction, that's kind of, that, that, that's kind of weird too. In the absence of any other data, it's easy, easy for us to say, I'm gonna go with the parent. I'm not getting much from the adolescent. I'm gonna go with them. We thought to ourselves, is there a way to test that? Is there a way to test this idea that maybe you see different patterns of reports from adolescents than parents, at least for some adolescents, because the adolescents are giving us something that the parent doesn't see, or they're attending to aspects of their lives that, that, that the parents are having difficulty to observing, like interactions with unfamiliar peers. So you think to yourself, well, how do you find that? I can't get a big school of people to give me peer, no in the peer research literature, you, you get peer nominations. You ask an entire school, who's shy? Who hits people? You know, and it's like one item measure each one. Um, uh, and and I, I, I like psychometric thingies. I, I hear one item measure and I think, mm, fake news. This is not good data. Um, uh, uh, so, so, so then what do you do? Our solution. Because I, I, I work at University of Maryland at College Park, and Debbie Beidel was there before I was there. There's a lot of great work at University of Central Florida now on social anxiety, treatment, and a variety of other things. So I, I talked to Debbie. I'm like, look, hey, Debbie, um, uh, you saw a bunch of adults and children, and you administer these behavioral tests that I like a whole lot. Um, I, I don't see a lot of people here in the samples that work with adolescents. How do you do this? Because what she does is she has these, these behavioral tasks where 
the, the client works or interacts with a peer of some kind. And she basically trained young kids or adults to be that, 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 uh, the, that stand in. Like, I don't have people that age. I don't have adolescents I can just bring in from high school or something like that. I can't, I, what do I do? And she says, well, when I was in your spot, ah, she's modeling, huh? She's just, not that kind of modeling. Mod, re, like modeling, modeling with the behavior modification. I mean, when I was in your shoes, I, I, I found young looking undergrads and dressed them down, right? I was like, oh, good idea, Debbie. <laughs> um, so we did that, but then it occurred to us when we were designing the study, why don't we treat them kind of like parents? Well, we give them the measure that the parent world is already completing, but modify the language a little bit instead of my child, the participant, or the adolescent. Why don't we just do that? Because we're going to get the behavioral coders to do stuff, but that takes forever to, to, to code a bunch of data. Let's give them the survey. So here's what we did. We, we, uh, we identify the most youthful looking of our undergrads. I know what you're thinking right now. These are 18, 19, 20 year olds. Teenagers? One word answer. Or two word answer. Molly Ringwald. Anybody here? Child of the 80s? Molly Ringwald? All right, yeah. So um, John Cusack, another two words. All right. These people have AARP cards when they were playing, when they were playing teenagers. <laughs> I'll show you a more contemporary example. More contemporary example. Tom Holland. That, that adorable man pretty guy from overseas who's playing Peter Parker now. He was 20 when he's playing a 15 year old. Two Spider Men before him, Tobey Maguire. Tobey Maguire's in his mid 20s when he's playing a 15 year old. The one in the middle, Andrew Garfield, 28. 28 playing a 15 year old. This happens all the time. Now, look, now look, a prerequisite for being a, 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 a stand in for an adolescent in our lab is not. A, a Golden Globe nomination. It's not. It's not. In fact, we can, and, and we'll talk about this in the workshop uh, in the afternoon. I work with them for two or three weeks. They learn some lines. They administer some standardized tasks. And it turns out that A, you know, they can do the tasks. They can administer the tasks. And, we, and they do uh, things like, like uh, they do some structured interactions where, where, uh, where, one of the, where the stand in is kind of like pretending to be you know, it's after school, and they're like, "Oh, how am I going to get this bike home? And then you wait, and then you say, now you say, and then the client reacts. We're trying to get a sense, do they, can they give us, you know, good social skills information, or, or, or how do they feel when they're in an interaction where the rules are kind of straightforward? Yeah, sure, you make eye contact and say, I can help you, all right? And then we also administer a series of interactions that are more unstructured in nature, where we give them very few lines. Pretend it's the first day at school. You sit down next to this, this uh, uh, you know, one of your classmates, and you say, and then we hear them talk for two or three minutes in this unstructured setting where they don't really know what to do. They just know it's the first day of school, right? And then we have them also do an impromptu speech, um, you know, because we presumably think that'll stress them out the most. It actually doesn't. Regardless of clinical status in our lab, the interaction that kids find most distressing is the unstructured one. Yeah. Yeah, uncertainty, yeah, uncertainty. It, it, it actually uh, yields um, you know, increased anxiety, low social skills, regardless of whether you're coming in for an evaluation or not. But you can use five minutes, 10 minutes. Oh, wow. I talked fast. I expected it to be worse than that. OK, um, so, 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 so then, of course, you know, after these interactions, the our, 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 our pretend, our peer confederate, we call them a peer confederate, uh, you know, uh, basically rates a couple of the measures that all three other, all the other informants rate. Freely available ones. Um, uh, Maddock and Clark social interaction anxiety scale, Maddock and Clark social phobia scale, like really quick measures you can complete in five or six minutes. And it's based on, on, a, on this idea in social psychology called thin slice judgments. This idea that you can get a sample of behavior a little bit of behavior. And based on that, you can make some decent predictions of people's personality traits. <clears throat> now, social anxiety is not a personality trait. It changes across context. So we were curious as to whether or not we could take that same concept. And based on 20 minutes of observation, can we get data from these peer confederates that yields complementary information, incremental information? It's giving us something that the parent doesn't give us. 
that some other independent observer doesn't give us. So what do the patterns look like? Patterns look like this. The adolescent impaired correlations, 0.3. In the absence of any other data, you're like 0.3. Geez, that's not very high. What do I do with that? And then you get the correlation between adolescent and peer confederate. 0.4 to 0.5. Large core. This is social anxiety, guys. This is not, I'm not asking about aggressive behavior. This is social anxiety. And then the confederate and parent are giving us, correlate, uh, giving us data that correlate very low with each other, much lower than, than anything we see. And what that translates into is that when you look to see, does the parent give us something to predict at least adolescent self-reports that the, the confederate doesn't? Yeah, sure, of course they do. But the reverse is also true. The peer confederate is giving us something incrementally in predicting at least adolescents don't self-reports that the parent doesn't give us. It gets a little cooler than that. During the interactions, or after the interactions, we have the, uh, the, uh, the adolescents complete what we call a self-assessment mannequin. Who's ever heard of this? Who's ever seen this? Show of hands. It's, it's a Sam. It's adorable. It's basically a graphical picture of where you, it's different emotions, but the one we use is arousal. And it's got like a point, it's got, it varies from one to five, where one is like a tiny little dot in the middle of your stomach, and five is like a big explosion, where it's like, oh, that hurts real bad. And then basically we ask the adolescents, uh, you know, on, on that scale, how do you feel right now? Very, sh uh, you know, quick shotgun blast of arousal. And it turns out that in, in tiny, minute, moment by moment interactions, you get really good data about changes in arousal across the interactions with this really quick measure. That's just a graphical measure of, people, of what people think or, think or feel. And, and they have the versions of this for all kinds of stuff. Anger, you know, all, all kinds of things, not just arousal. This is an internal process. This is what you think you feel inside. The confederates are predicting that data over and above the kid's arousal before anything else happened, which already correlates with what happens during the task is like 0.4, 0.5. There's not much else you predict over and above that because in social science research, everything correlates at about 0.3. But the confederates are giving us that data. They're actually, you can use their subjective reports to predict what the kid's subjective is experiencing internally in those interactions. But not the parents. Not the parents' data. The parents' data doesn't predict it, which makes complete sense. They do not see, they do not tend to see on average these adolescents and how they interact with unfamiliar peers. You get it from the confederates, not the parents. And then it turns out when we've done, we've, we've also done the more time intensive stuff of the independent observers, they code, they use a well established scale that every bottles group uses, that we use as well. And it turns out that when you look at the, uh, the data, what you find is that the confederate reports are uniquely predicting what the independent observers are saying over and above what everybody else is saying. So they're, they're giving us some degree of context specificity in, in, their, in their ratings, they're giving us something in the unfamiliar peer context, we're not getting anywhere else. So, where is this heading? Because this, this is getting us closer, at least with these social anxiety assessments, to really figuring out how to use these data, uh, you know, at least in research. But we're still at this point where it's really hard to come to uh, a decision with all these data at the individual case. We're working on it. And we're finding some really interesting stuff internally in our, in our, own, in our, in our lab that I want to start seeing if it replicates in other places before I ever tell anybody publicly. But, 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 but know that one of the big things we're doing right now is figuring out can we get to, if we pick our informants right, if we pick our sources right, if we pick our data right, can we dwindle all this data down to one number that we can start using to make decisions about these kids? Okay, so. That's it. Um, the teaser, that's a teaser for the workshop's going to be about three hours of that. Um, and we'll talk a bit more about why we do it and all the hows and whys and the bells and whistles and stuff. And, and you get a script. If you show up, you get a script. We'll give you our scripts. All right? So, uh, so, that's, uh, so uh, I think we have a few minutes for questions, right? About five minutes? Five minutes for questions? Um, for, for those of us in the field, you're, you're talking mostly at the level of assessment. Yes. Okay. I'm equally or more interested at the level of intervention. Me too. So could you talk to me a little bit about like w w once you get your direction and your understanding yeah. ass assessment, so wh where, what do you do, where do you go to the next step for intervention? 
So the way I've been thinking about intervention with these multi-informant assessments is this. If we start, if we think about these data at the level of I'm going to average these scores out, whoever's got, whoever says, if I, I'll, I'll treat regardless of, the, uh, of who says it, you know, you may be administering an intervention that's getting at some of the problems you're, 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 you're dealing with, but you're spending a lot of time in context that, where, where, where it's better served in other places. So let's say you have this kid who shows really profound levels of impairment based on teacher report but not parent report, and those data are telling you something meaningful, that the concerns are happening in, school, in the school context to a greater extent than the home context. Would you administer your parenting intervention the same way? Would you administer your problem solving skills intervention the same way? as you would if the, if, the, if, if, uh, if the kid was displaying concerns across contexts. If you would, if you are, then you might be wasting your time with, with, uh, with the intervention work you're doing in the home setting, which you should be doing maybe is monitoring what's happening in the home setting and actively intervening in the school setting. That's where I think these discrepancies may very well be useful in intervention contexts. Uh, I'm not, we're not at a point yet where we can say definitively, this is how you do it in the context of matching these informants reports to intervention settings. But, 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 uh, but that's, where the, that's where the clinical implications of these discrepancies are profound. Uh, because they could allow you to tailor interventions to meet the unique needs of, adult, uh, of children and adolescents depending on the specific context where they show concerns. It, it should presumably make intervention more cost effective uh, you know, show me the funding agency that's going to give you a controlled trial to, 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 test, to, to test that idea. Um, um, but it's, it's one of those things where, where, uh, where I think that's where, that's where the key clinical implications are with regards to characterizing concerns. It's matching uh, 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 intervention to the specific places where they, tend, where they tend to show concerns. Yeah, good question. At the parent level, I find if the home is less structured and the child kind of gets to do what they want, yeah. then you get a different type of child than oh, a child yeah. who might have more routines established. So it might match the school a little bit more. And at the school setting, I found that some teachers really, they have great intentions, but they really don't understand the questions on the form or how to interpret the questions. Yeah. Or if you ask a question how they interact with their peers, they might say, oh, they're great. But then you look in the classroom and the mm -hmm. child is seated their desk is pushed next to the teacher desk. So, of course, they have great interactions because they're not interacting. Yeah. Do you find that as well? Yeah, I mean, I, that's the thing that's tough with these survey reports is these reports aren't contextualized. You know, in order to hold the, the, uh, the items constant across people, you have to say, are they shy? Are they aggressive? Are they angry? Are they hyperactive? Uh, so it's, it's rarely the case that, that, that you can contextualize things to that extent. Now, in the home setting, you would find very different, I would predict you'd find very different question, uh, uh, answers depending on, on multi-informant assessments in the home setting, particularly if, if parental authority figures have very different kinds of relationships with their kids. I mean, we, we, see, we see families do this all the time, where, where, uh, where, one, where one parent might say one thing and another parent might say nothing. It's like, yeah, of course, one of you is hanging out with them on the weekends and it's leisure activity stuff. Yeah, they're not going to show much there. It's fun. Uh, you know, it's not fun to do chores. It's not fun to do homework. And that's where you're going to get the, that's where you're going to get the struggles. That's where you're going to get the, the displays of concerns. Yeah, so that makes complete sense. That's one of the limitations of our measures. Yeah. Although we are finding some internal data I have to replicate it, but we are finding internally, I've always thought if you want to understand these discrepancies, everybody's got to complete the same items. There's some preliminary data in our in our in our uh, in our uh, in our in our assessments of social anxiety that points us to thinking maybe we they don't need to complete the same measures, the same items. It might go even further than that. Maybe they don't have to complete the same measure of the same problem. Maybe you might need three great informants rating something they're good at rating. That's, that's what we're seeing now in our data, and then and we're looking to see whether or not it replicates in other places. Because if that's the case, then it might make a lot of this work much more straightforward than we originally thought. Good question. 